Matthew chapter 21. We're going to begin reading at verse 1. And we're going to go down to about verse 11, I guess. Let's see what's there. Matthew chapter 21, beginning to read at verse 1. My Bible says this. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell them that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Let's pray. Our Father, we're thankful today for the opportunity that we have to be able to be here. Our Father, we're thankful for your spirit that guides and leads our lives, our moments, our weeks, and our days. And Father, we ask this morning that your holy presence would guide our hearts and our minds now as we look into your word. And Father, we gather around your throne as, a, as, a, as young children gather to their father, as young children gather to their parents. And Father, we've come from all different walks of life, and, and you know what our weeks have been like, and and Father, we, you know that, that we come to you with, uh, with the cares and the burdens and the difficulties and all the stuff of what was. And yet, Father, in our minds and in our spirits, sometimes it still is. And Father, I pray, Lord, this morning, and I lift to you in arms of faith these that are here. And Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be very real and near to them, that you would touch them with an anointing and a power from on high that, that plugs them into the peace that passes all understanding. Uh, Father, perhaps some have come today, and, and Lord, you know, it's been, a, it's been a really difficult week last week. There's been <clears throat> there's been problems, and, 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 and maybe it's with family, or maybe it's with work, or maybe it's with finances, or, or maybe, Father, it's with, with future things, or maybe it's with health, or maybe it's with, with, uh, with uh, things in our minds or, or, or in our personalities. But, Father, there's, there's stuff that, that distracts from the words that flow from your throne. And, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name that you would touch them in a very real and definite and powerful way that they would know this day that your peace rests upon their hearts. Father, we pray, Lord, for those who aren't with us today for reasons of travel or work or sickness or whatever it might be. And Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would touch them. I ask, Father, that you would surround them with mercy and strength and blessing. I ask, Father, that you would touch them with safety and protection and, and, and bless them, Father, in such a way that, that they would know that, that someone lifts them to your throne today and help them, Father, to, to find a time to worship you somewhere. And, Father, we pray, Lord, for the churches that meet in this community and, and in this county and in this province and in this region and in this country and in this continent and in this world. 
Uh, Father, we pray, Lord, for all the churches of Oxford, and we ask, Lord, that, that wherever your name is named as, as Savior and God and King, that, Father, that you would bless those Christians that gather, bless those that share your word, bless those that lift to you songs of praise and testimony. Father, be glorified in their midst. Father, this morning we, we want to look into your word. And Father, as often is the case, we, we have needs today. And Father, for some, there is a fresh anointing that needs to happen in their, in their lives. And so, Father, I pray, O oh God, that you would bless them. And, and Father, that you would push back the walls of darkness that, that seem to creep into our lives. Push back, Father, the walls of confusion. Push back, Father, the, the things that distract in our, in our daily existence from, from honoring you and worshiping you and knowing you. Father, there are some here who need a special touch from your hand. Father, I don't know what that is, but Father, I, I know that they're here. I don't know who they are, Father, but I sense them calling out to you. And Father, we want to join with them in prayer. That Father, that you would that you would bless them as they touch the hem of your garment. Father, as they come to you in the humble quietness of their own hearts, we pray, Father, that as they stretch out their hand to receive whatever you would place within it. That, Father, that you would be glorified and, Father, they would, they would sense and know the joy and the peace of your presence. So, Father, we commit them to you. And, Father, here now as we do look into your word, very humbly, very sincerely, Lord, with all that I am, I ask, Father, in Jesus' name, that no word would come from this mouth except it be according to thy will. Father, if it be so, I would just ask, Lord, that you would clothe yourself with this form and speak clearly and distinctly through this, this mouth and these words. For we want to know, thus saith the Lord. And so, Father, guide us, I pray. Lead us. Show us thy truth. Father, for it is in Jesus' name I ask it and pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 21, here the passage that we have, the end is in sight of Jesus' ministry. And we, we reckon it's Palm Sunday, isn't it? Palm Sunday, and, and I remember, you know, back in the old days when, uh, you know, we all the kids, we cut out the little palm branches and have the little palm processions. And I think, Mrs. Hickey, you was the leader of that, weren't you? Um, I do remember that, yes. You know, it's funny what you remember when you think back of, of to the old days, you know, and and growing up, and then uh, then all the little palm things, uh, you know, and Easter, and, and chocolate bunnies, and Easter eggs, and, and, you know, little bows, and all that kind of stuff that your mother would make you wear, you know, and all that sort of thing. Not me, of course, but, you know, my brother, but, uh, no, not really. Anyway. But, you know, it's interesting, as we approach the this season of the year, that we think of of what Easter is and, and all that it all that it should be in our in our lives. And and here Jesus is approaching this very same time and he's coming to the to Jerusalem and he's coming in on, on this Palm Sunday event. And as we were to look at this again, if you have your Bibles, kind of follow along with me. It says there, as they approached Jerusalem and they came through Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, that Jesus sent two of his disciples. He said to the disciples, he said, he said, you know, I want you to go ahead and, and in a certain place, you know, go into the village ahead of you and, and there you're going to find, you know, a donkey tied to the post and a, and a, and a, and a, another small one there and her coat by her side. I want you to untie them and to bring them to me. Now, I suppose someone's going to say something about that. You know, Jesus says, so I, I suppose. Someone's going to say, you know, what do you think you're doing? You know, what, what's up with you? Is this, uh, is, your, is your name on this donkey? In other words, Jesus is saying, when someone asks you, what are you doing? You say to them this, these exact words. If anyone, this is what he said there in verse 3. If anyone says anything to you, tell them that the Lord needs them 
and he will send them right away. Now this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. And, uh, and we can see what it says in verse 5. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. And they brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. Now in the other, in the other uh, gospels, we find that, that there was a discussion, and the guy came out, the owner came out, and he said, he said so, uh, so, so tell me, you know, what, what gives here? Uh, this, these, these are my animals here, and, and they're out here for a purpose, you know, and, and, and maybe he was thinking to himself that, that, you know, last night I had the strangest dream. Last night, you know, that, that there was an angel in my dream, and he, he said to me, he said, you know, uh, uh, Matthew, you need to get up and get out and, 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 and tie your donkey to the front hitching post there and, and bring the colt too. And he said, well, why, why would I do that? I'm not going to use it, and you know all that. And he said, but there was such an impression on my life that I had to do this random thing. You know, why else would the donkey be there? You know, the, the stage was set. And as Jesus is moving through the end days of his ministry, he was calling on specific people to do random events. And he said, you know, as we read through that, it seems that there was some kind of a dialogue that had happened previously to the disciples showing up. And Jesus told them specifically what to say. You know, it's, it's curious there, verse 3, he says, if anyone says anything to you, well, why wouldn't they say something to him? You know, if I went up, you know, if, of course, if I went to Delbert's house and and uh, and I and I just kind of stopped in and and got into his very fine Kubota tractor there and started driving it down the road, he'd come running after me because I'm sure he would, because he knows how I drive and he'd say, "Mark, what what's up with you? What are you doing?" And I could say maybe something that the Lord said I should do this and go there and and unless there was a previous action on his heart, he would say, "Well, until the Lord talks to me, you ain't taking this." You know what I'm saying? So there was a previous action, some kind of a random event that happened here as, as time went on. And Jesus instructed them what was going to say and what was going to happen. And in both situations, both of these people, both of these groups had to be intensely obedient, not knowing there was someone else involved. So we have there the guy who owned the animals. And he said, okay, Lord, I don't understand this, but I'm going to take them out. I'm going to, I'm going to hitch them to this rail right here. So out, out he did, and maybe he sat down in the rocket chair, just kind of folded his arms with a cup of tea close by, rocked back and forth, said, now I'm going to see what's going to happen. There he sat. By and by up came these two fellas up the road, and they began just, they completely ignored him, went up right up there, started unhitching it, and he said, what are you doing? And they said, the Lord said we should do this. He said, okay, I've been waiting for you all day, and in the house he went. I mean, that, that's kind of what happens in my mind as I read that. We don't get all that very fine detail, but that seems to me to be what happens. That the Lord had prepared the events as time was going on. Now, the thing that stands out in my mind is how often does the Lord desire to prepare events in the lives of the world today with you as one of the participants, and we say, Lord, that's foolish. Lord, that's crazy. Lord, I'm not buying this. Lord, I, I know that you're saying that I need to go get a ticket for somebody's plane and, and I need to go down to Halifax Airport and maybe this is her name and I got no idea who that is. You know, that actually happened. I can tell you a story, but it take you a long time. You know, and there the person was standing, had no idea who it was that they were supposed to meet or anything like that. And they just kind of stood there with the ticket, didn't know the name on the ticket, but they felt impressed to buy this person's ticket. Like, obviously, this was a while ago when you could actually do that kind of stuff without a passport. And then they saw them coming towards them. And they said, uh, you're supposed to have this. And walked away. And the person said, yep. The Lord had talked to them. They were the ones who was writing this in the, in the book. And they said the Lord had talked to them and said, you know, you need to get yourself to such and such a place. They said, I've got no money to go anywhere. And so then the Lord said to them, so did you just get, do the best you can, get as far as you can? They said, well, I can get to the airport. It's only five miles down the road, and I can walk that far. So down they went. They walked to there. They thought, you know, I'm just going to walk in, see what happens. Probably nothing going to happen because it's all in my mind anyway. And, and lo and behold, somebody came up to them, and they said, the Lord said you should have this. And then they were gone. And I wondered to myself, how, how often... Does God want to move events in the lives of the world today, but his people, his disciples, his followers, say, Lord, that's, that's crazy. 
I, I, you know, I think, I think you ought to try that one time. You, you feel God speaking to your heart, and you just kind of, you know, you say, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm going to try this, but don't tell anybody, okay, Lord? I'm gonna I'm gonna try this and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna you know in effect I'm gonna take my little donkey out and I'm gonna tie it to the hitching rail I'm gonna just watch and see what happens or whatever that donkey might be. There were situations that had taken place that led up to the fulfillment of the prophecy that was spoken of here and it's spoken of in Zechariah nine and verse nine. And there it says, Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went up. They did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them. Jesus sat on them, and a very large crowd gathered around. And they, and they took off their jackets. They put them on the road, while others cut palm branches and spread them on the road. And the crowds went ahead of him and those that followed, and they shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered uh, Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred, and he asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus. This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. You see, the events that led up to Jesus moving in here, the events that led up to all the crowd saying, Jesus has arrived, dealt with specific small tasks of obedience. You know, I was, uh, I was going over the, the passage here and thinking about it and reading about it, and, uh, and I, I couldn't help but think to myself, you know, where it says... I, it, it says there, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, that should be a song. Blessed is he who comes in the... Yeah, you get it. You know what I'm saying. It's, but blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And I thought to myself, okay, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Why? Why? Why is he blessed? Why is... Why does... You know, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Why? I... You know, maybe... You know, as I was reading this and, and, and I, was, I was thinking in my mind, the picture of all this happening, that Jesus was coming in and there's there huge crowds all around him and, and, the, and the donkey was moving up the street and, and people were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. And, and, and think of the, the, the mass and the energy and the, the volume of the people and, and all that was going on. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I thought if, if I was there, knowing what I know now, going back to that time there, I'd be thinking, hmm, Jesus is going to die here shortly. Jesus is going to be put to death here shortly. Jesus is going to be betrayed here shortly. Jesus is going to be taken and he's going to be beaten so that no one would even recognize who he was here shortly. Jesus is in his bleeding and, and bruised and, 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 and just is almost destroyed physically. He takes the cross and he puts, they, they slam it down on his shoulder and he, and he, and he walks with it through the streets of Jerusalem here just shortly. So tell me again, how is he blessed? He who comes in the name of the Lord. How, how is that? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Lord, if that's blessing, I, you know, I'm not give somebody else a double portion of my stuff. You know, and, and looking at that, I thought to myself, where it says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the question that kept popping out to me was, well, why? Why would they say this? Well, if you have your Bibles, may, would you turn with me over to, to uh, Psalm chapter 100, or Psalm 118. Psalm 118. And there, there's a passage of Scripture where this actually comes from, just so you have the reference to it. Because what he's talking of here, this is, this is the crowd saying, and they were anticipating, they were expecting, and they were, they were wanting this. They were, they were hoping for this, that this was the day that the Messiah would be there. So Psalm 118, verse 26. Well, you know, let's start at verse, verse 19 so we get the whole background of it and not take it out of context. Verse 19 of Psalm 118. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. 
This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this. And it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Verse 26 there it says, or verse 25, it says, Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. And blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. So over in Matthew, Jesus is moving into the city. The people have lined all the, the streets and, 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 and maybe they're recognizing what, what the psalmist wrote about there. And so they're shouting, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Over in, uh, I think it might be Luke, chapter 19. We have this same procession happening. Verse 28 and following down. We have the same thing about the, uh, the colt and the donkey. Down to verse 32, we find it's just as they said, you know, we go on down through that. Verse 38, it says, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Pray peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And, and then some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, they said, Teacher, Rebuke your disciples. What are you doing? I, I, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And then as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known in this day what would bring you peace. But now it's hidden from your eyes. And then he went on to speak of a judgment that was coming on them. But, but in, this, in this whole context, in this whole time here, you know, Luke writes about it, and he, and, he, and he writes about it. He says, yes, Jesus got on the donkey, and he, and he rode in Jerusalem, and, and the people were all there, and they're shouting and praising God, and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then, and then as Jesus got close to it, the people were all seeing this with a, with a certain kind of mindset. But Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was coming in, and he had his own mindset, and it was the mindset of the Father. And as he saw Jerusalem there, he saw it in its destruction. And he wept over it. And, 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 and I can imagine that with, with huge tears rolling down his cheeks, he cried out and he said, If you, even you, had known on this day what would bring you peace, now it's too late. Now it's too late. You had your chance, Jerusalem. For all these years, I was here, and now you're on the, you're on the, you know, you're, you're lining the streets and you're shouting, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, but you don't understand what has just happened. The door was open. You could have been filled with peace and joy and salvation, but now it is too late. Now it is hidden from your eyes. That's what's, look, it says right, right there. I got the NIV. I'll let me read it for you again. But now it is hidden from your eyes. Doesn't get much clearer than that, does it? <clears throat> Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The people view Jesus in a particular way. Jesus viewed this whole situation through the eyes of the Father. 
to all that was and the, and the creative powers of salvation and what all of that means and is, and is going to mean and did mean. And, and he, he came in in his own mindset and for the, for the best that he could, the, the people just weren't getting it. They weren't understanding it. You know, and through the Gospels, we find the Thomas event. We find the Philip event. Lord, show us the way it's going to be enough. And Jesus shaking his head saying, how long do I got to be talking to you folks about this? He said, and now as he's marching up here, and they're all happy and, you know, full of, full of joy and celebration. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus is, is weeping here for them. Because he's seeing them in the light of eternity. And he's saying to them, he said, now, you know, your days were these days. And you didn't clue in. You didn't see it. You didn't understand. You let everything kind of float by. The doors were open. And you could have gone through. And you said, you just kind of folded your arms and said, Lord, this is... I'm not, I'm not buying this. Lord, I'm going to look foolish. Lord, you asked me to tie my donkey to the hitching post out front. You know, I don't know what you're trying. What good is that in the kingdom of God? You understand what I'm saying? here? John chapter 16, verse 24. You got your Bible. Kind of flip over to that real quick. John chapter. Ah, let's look at John chapter 14 first, you know, because that's an interesting one. John chapter 14. Verse 27. Here again, it's Jesus talking. And he said, <clears throat> look, look at what he says here. He says, peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. So don't let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Verse 30. Let's go down there at the end of the chapter. I will not speak with you much longer. For the prince of this world is coming. Now he has no hold on me. But the world must learn. That I love the father. And that I do exactly. What my father. Has commanded me. He says, I will not speak with you much longer, for the prince of this world is coming. Now he has no hold on me, but the world must learn that I love the Father, and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Now if you flip over to chapter 16, the last verse there, verse 33, we find here Jesus again is saying, he says, I have told you these things, so that in me, you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. See, what, what, what the psalmist was writing here was a, was a divine revelation about the Christian life, about a follower of the Father. And when it says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, doesn't necessarily mean he's blessed financially. Doesn't necessarily mean that they're blessed with a kind of a giddy uh, silliness all the time, you know, and, and smiling. Somebody said to me, Mark, you better sh uh, shave your mustache off because, you know, Christians are supposed to be happy all the time. Well, that's a problem for me because I'm not happy all the time. Sometimes I'm downright annoyed. And I know I'm the only one here that's like that. But that's the case. You know, and, and, and the whole point of that is, is that we still live our lives, but there is a peace that settles into us that's not like the world's peace. Now, let me define that for you a little bit. The world's peace comes along and... You know, and, and when, okay, here's, this, here's an example. You got, you got a whole lot of month left and a whole little bit of money. And you got more month than money. Now, in the world situation, and we all go through that kind of stuff by times, but in the world situation, we kind of could lose our peace. Well, well, how about this? You've, you know, you decided to retire. And you've got your RSPs all there, and they're all in Nortel. Eh? Probably that never happened to anybody. It happened to me, you know, and it wasn't, I wasn't impressed. 
You know, I know what it's like to lose an earthly sense of peace because our peace is kind of tied to security somehow. And now we're thinking to ourselves, man, I guess I won't be retired when I thought I was going to be retired. You know, and all of a sudden our world gets all kerfuffled and everything else, and we kind of lose our peace and we're upset and all that. But Jesus said, I don't give that kind of peace. The peace I give to you is the peace that you have going through the valley of the shadows of death and uncertainty and financial collapse and all these things. There's a peace that you can expect in that. And see, Jesus had that. And in my mind, as I see him going up, you know, here on Palm Sunday, and everybody's shouting, you know, Hosanna, you know, he who comes in the name of the Lord, and, and he's blessed and all this, and Jesus stops, and in his heart, he's not feeling like all the rest of them, because he sees here with an eternal mindset, and in his eternal mindset, he sees a fallen and lost world dying in sin. And he weeps over the situation, and he's and he's saying there where he says, you know, that uh, that that he he wept over it. He said, "You don't understand the things which belong to your peace." But now, too late. Jesus came to bring peace, not a cessation, not a stopping of hostilities but a peace in the midst of the traumas of life. <clears throat> I, I once, a long time ago, was in politics. Can you imagine such a thing? Somebody as shy and bashful as I am. And uh, um, we were talking about some things that were serious, and it was about, basically, if I were to sum it up, it was about legislating morality. and. Uh, and, and finally, it, we came to the conclusion, you cannot legislate morality. That was the conclusion. It has to be a heart change within. It has to be when God comes by and does something dramatic inside us, then the change happens. Or else all you're doing is enforcing something that goes against whatever is bubbling up inside the person. And you can, you can fill in the blanks of whatever that morality might be. But that's what Jesus does. He comes by to us and he gives us peace and he changes our heart and he changes our mindset and he gives us life. Now, now notice what it says here. It says, blessed, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay, I've got to say it. There's power in the name of Jesus. I, I just got to say that. You know, There is power in the name of Jesus. You know, uh, um, Romans chapter 10. See if I can find that real quick because it's a passage there I want to read for you. Romans chapter 10 and uh, verse 13 there. It says... Uh, Romans 10 to 13. For everyone who calls on the, what's that say? Oh, the name of. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's power in the name of Jesus. Now, over in Acts chapter 19, I mean, we looked at that for quite some time, uh, for a number of weeks. But over there, you remember there was the seven sons of Sceva? And Paul was in Ephesus then, and he was casting out demons and doing all that kind of stuff, and healing the sick, and preaching the gospel, and, and people were getting saved, and they were getting filled with the Holy Spirit, and some amazing things were happening. So the seven sons of Sceva thought to themselves, this is a pretty good trick. So out they go, and they start doing this. And uh, and as they're doing all this, you know, they, they this is what they said, you know, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, we command you to leave this person. And then the, the demon, you can just picture the guy's head wheeling around. Saying, yeah. Paul I know. Jesus I know. But I don't know you. Boy, wouldn't you get a sinking feel in your stomach just about that time? You know, Paul I know. Jesus I know. But I got no idea who you are. You see, there's power in the name of Jesus for those who are his. So there is a tie there, isn't there? 
There's power in the name of Jesus for those who are his. He says, because Paul I know. We know Paul. He's the biggest troublemaker, you know, to the forces of darkness we got going. His hanky's going around and they're doing all kinds of things. We want to get rid of Paul. We know Paul, but we don't know you, you seven sons of Sceva. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts. Very, very quickly. Just one-liners. If you've got a pencil, you might want to write them down on the back of your bulletin there. Not sure. First one is this. God is honored in your obedience to what he asks. If you hear him say to you, I need you to go tie your donkey to the hitching rail out front of the, of the house today, I would say you probably need to do that. God is honored in your obedience, however great or small that it is in every day. Second thing that I want to I want to leave you with today is blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And you are blessed when you go in the name of the Lord. And that doesn't mean financial blessing, or that doesn't mean giddy happiness. It means you are blessed by the hand of God in representing him in his name in the world around you. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The last thing I want you to know of this morning is this. If God asks you, and you go, or you do, however great or small that is, there's power in that name of Jesus for you today. Power in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> You know, sometimes God calls us to things and we hesitate, we vacillate, we digress, we say no. But we miss so much of the blessed blessing when we do that. To demonstrate, to know, to feel, to sense the power in the name of Jesus Christ in the world through your life today. Someone said to us one time, or they, it was in the Bible, they said, where, where are all the acts of God that our fathers taught us about? Where, where, where are they? Does God not do the same thing? The only thing that's changed is the people he's talking to. Give that a thought for a minute. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, we're thankful today for the opportunity that we have to be here in this place, to understand and to know your will. And Father, just to, to, to see your words here before us. And Father, to read them in black and white and red, even. And Father, we recognize that there is power in the name of Jesus for these who are here today. And Lord Jesus, that, that as we wander through life, as we move along with you, as we, as we go up to our Jerusalem, Father, we recognize that you go with us, and, and as we go, we hear your instruction to go ahead and make this ready and make that ready and, and go to the upper room and get everything set and, and go and loose the donkey and bring the colt, and we want everything to be fulfilled. And, and Father, it, it is just simple obedience and very basic simplicity of saying, yes, Lord, I don't understand, but I hear your voice. And I'll go stand on the street corner and wait for you to give me the next word. And Father, help us, Lord, to, to know and to sense the peace that comes in obedience to you, to, to know, to sense, and to realize, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Father, we recognize there's power in the name of Jesus. 
And Father, in these closing moments, I pray, O oh Lord, today that you would guide our hearts. Father, we want to be sensitive to you. We ask, Father, that you would show us your will. And perhaps, Lord, there are some here who just need to spend some time in prayer. We want to give them that opportunity. We've come corporately to gather here, to listen to your word, to sing some songs, to worship you. And Father, now here we are with you, privately and individually. We sense your spirit moving across this place. Sense it moving from side to side and front to back. And, and Father, we want to be sensitive to you. For we've come just for this purpose today. So, Father, as we sing this last song, I pray, O oh Lord, that you would be lifted up, that you would be glorified in our obedience, however great or small it might be. There's power in the name of Jesus today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>